Hello viewers, continuing chapter 5, we have humanistic therapy for today, which talks about psychological distress arising from feelings of insecurity, feelings of a lot of loneliness, alienation, inability to find meaning and genuine purpose in life. We are clubbing humanistic and existential therapy because existential therapy deals with the meaning of life, the perspective of life, the concept of choice, responsibility. Humanistic also deals with giving regard to the person, the way the person feels. There are obstacles in the person's path which may result in low self-confidence, the kind of self the person has. So all these are concepts which are being dealt with humanistic and existential therapy. Humans are motivated by the desire for personal growth, by self-actualization. That is one of the major aspects on which humanistic therapy works. Self-actualization is an innate need that moves a person to become complex, balanced and integrated. So this is a basic innate need and energy which motivates a person to become relatively balanced. It's the highest need in Maslow's need hierarchy and very few people are able to achieve that. They spend the whole life reaching for this last and the highest stage. Then this particular therapy also deals with the obstacles which are there because in a person's daily life, emotional expression is curbed by society, which results in destructive behavior as well as negative emotions. So healing or therapy occurs when the client is able to perceive these feelings and is able to remove these obstacles with the help of a therapist who is a facilitator in change. So the person is able to accept his own self and his own feelings integrated with this thinking and therefore is able to become balanced. He is able to accept himself the way he or she is. That's because the therapist is able to accept him the way he or she is. Let's move on to the Gestalt therapy. Now, Gestalt therapy is given by Frederick and Laura Pearls, who basically talked about the concept of increasing a person's self-awareness and self-acceptance. They used a lot of group techniques where the person was able to understand himself or herself because the person was made aware of living in the present, of dealing with understanding his own, own her issues. So the client is taught to recognize the bodily processes and the emotions that are being blocked out of from awareness. He or she has to act out these fantasies about the feelings and conflicts and therefore becomes more integrated and is able to accept them. So awareness, acceptance and change. That is the process which Gestalt therapists follow. Next we have is the client-centered therapy, which is an outshoot of humanistic therapy propagated by Carl Rogers. According to Carl Rogers, where he tried to integrate the concept of self, freedom and choice as one of the main aspects of psychotherapy. Now in this, we are basically wanting to understand the conditions of growth. What condition does the therapist provide, the environment that the therapist provides, the relationship that the therapist provides, because of which the change becomes natural. So the therapist is a facilitator here. He or she provides a warm relationship in which the client can connect with the disoriented feelings and the condition of growth are very important. The conditions are themselves healing. So conditions of growth are empathy, where the person's feelings are understood as if it was therapist's own feelings which sets up the resonance between the therapist and the client. So the way the person feels it, the way the person understands the experiences, the therapist understands it just like that, which changes the person. The person becomes more accepting of his own situation. Second is unconditional positive regard, which is the total acceptance of the client as he or she is. So no judgment is being given non-judgmental attitude, the person is accepted and this makes the person feel very secure and the person can openly share the thoughts and feelings without suppressing anything. The person can also trust the therapist. So this condition is also healing in itself. It provides a very permissive, non-judgmental and accepting environment where the client's feelings can be expressed freely and therefore healing starts. Client-centered therapy also ensures that the person is reflecting on the feeling. So the therapist acts as a mirror who is giving back the feelings to the client and therefore the client has now a choice and the freedom to explore the behavior and the client is able to take responsibility for that behavior and for the change.
In this also the person's unique experiences are understood and that initiates the change of self-growth and the person is able to take on the real self because he or she knows there is no need to suppress any thoughts or feelings. They are being accepted, they are being openly discussed about. So the person integrates all of that with the real self. The next therapy that we have is the existential therapy given by Viktor Frankl and in this he gave the concept of logotherapy which means the treatment for the soul. Existential therapy basically deals with meaning making which means finding meaning in life threatening situations and this person's quest for finding the spiritual truth of one's existence. This is also following a spiritual unconscious which is there in all of us. It is a storehouse of love, aesthetic awareness and values of life. Now in this we also have concept of anxiety because a lot of times we are trying to understand who are we and why are we here. These are all anxieties and questions about life where we are looking for meanings. So we have neurotic anxieties dealing with the problems of life which are attached to the physical, psychological or spiritual aspects of one's life. And we also have spiritual anxieties which lead to meaninglessness and hence are called as existential anxiety that is spiritual anxiety of the spiritual origin. To help the person find meaning and responsibility in life, to help the person understand the situations from a larger perspective, that is the role which is played by the existential therapist. The therapist is also doing self-disclosure, sharing his own feelings, values and experiences with the person and a lot of uh, emphasis is on the present moment. Transference is actively discouraged because a lot of time there is transference of anxiety from the client to the therapist or the therapist to the client which is discouraged. The present moment is the most important to understand the existential perspective. Next we have is the biomedical therapy. In this like the name suggests bio, biological and medical medicines are prescribed by psychiatrist which is under proper medical supervision. The medicines once prescribed should be taken or discontinued with reference to the psychiatrist. The dosage has to be monitored so that there is no problem later or the person is not dependent on medication or the person is not able to follow the proper treatment modality if the person leaves medication. So medicines are very important because we have neurotransmitters in our brain and those neurotransmitters are being worked by through the medication. A lot of disorders are being treated especially schizophrenia and bipolar disorder which require antipsychotic drugs. We also have common mental disorder of generalized anxiety and reactive depression but they require milder drugs because they are relatively milder disorders. Then these drugs like we discussed are working on the neurotransmitters, the chemicals in the brain. For instance, GABA which is a neurotransmitter works on anxiety disorders. Similarly, dopamine which is a neurotransmitter deals with schizophrenia and serotonin is dealing with depression. Now in case medicines are not working for a certain disorder, in that case as a last resort very mild electric shocks are given via electrodes which are attached to the person's brain to induce convulsions. But these are also as a last resort and under supervision by the psychiatrist in case the medicine does not work. This form of biomedical therapy is known as ECT, electroconvulsion therapy, short but also important from the exam point of view. This shock treatment like we discuss is controlling the symptoms in the patient only when drugs are not able to improve the condition. Next that we have is the factors contributing to healing in psychotherapy. Here there are four factors which we will be considering which result in healing or not in psychotherapy. First is type of technique. Now behavior system and CBT school are adopted to heal an anxious person where we are using relaxation and cognitive restructuring which results in healing. Similarly, psychodynamic is used for schizophrenia, somatoform disorders and dissociative disorders and humanistic is used for enhancing the self-confidence of a person. Now second factor is therapeutic alliance. Now every therapy has healing properties because of the regular availability of the therapist, the warmth and empathy provided by the therapist. And the third factor is catharsis. While the patient being interviewed is sharing a lot of thoughts, 
which help the therapist to understand the nature of the problem. The client is unburdening the emotional problems being faced. That is a very important aspect in therapy. Half the problems are sorted out just by sharing. And the therapist is non-judgmental. So the therapist is actively listening and not reacting or responding, providing acceptance and being non-judgmental. Therefore, a lot of healing happens. The person is able to get thoughts which are positive and hopeful to help the person deal with the situation. We are not able to deal with the situation because our emotions block our thoughts. Once the emotions are released, the sharing happens, thereafter the person is able to think clearly and is able to find his own answers. Last factor we have is the non-specific factor. Non-specific because it is not specific to any form of psychotherapy. It includes all kinds of therapy. These are two major factors, the patient variable and the therapist variable. The patient variable, which is the motivation for change, expectation of improvement due to treatment, that is a patient variable. Let's look at the therapist variable. Positive nature, absence of unresolved emotional conflicts. If the therapist himself or herself is having emotional conflict which are not sorted out, it will also automatically be transferred on to the client where the resolution of the problem will be the therapist, the way therapist thinks about it or wanted to do it for his own problem. So that will result in a major problem of transference and counter transference. That is why the therapist needs to be sorted out himself or herself. He needs to undergo self-counseling and counseling under supervision to then be able to give it to the other person. Also presence of good mental health. If with every client the anxiety is generated within the therapist, it will result in a problem. So this also needs to be worked on. Then we have is ethics in psychotherapy. First is informed consent needs to be taken. The person needs to be aware. In case there's a problem, the person needs to be talked to. And without the person's consent, the information cannot be leaked out. That is confidentiality. Privacy has to be maintained. That is the respect the client and the trust the client has on the therapist. Next is elevating personal distress. That is a problem because of which the person comes to the therapist. So that needs to be worked down also. Then we have integrity of the patient and therapist relationship. The decency and the dignity of the professional relationship has to be maintained. No kind of intimacy, no kind of breaking of trust, no kind of Overindulgence needs to be there, that is the integrity. Also professional competence and skills, if the person is not capable enough, not professionally competent, the person will do a lot more harm to the person than helping. Next we have is alternative therapies. Now they are called so because they provide alternative possibilities to the conventional drug treatment or psychotherapy. They include yoga, which is an ancient form or technique, Indian technique. Ashtang Yoga of Patanjali. Patanjali is Yoga Sutra, the eight stages of yoga which have been emphasized by the sage or the yogi Patanjali are very popular. It refers to the asanas or body postures along with the breathing practices which we call as pranayam. It's a combination of these two but along with these two we have six more procedures under it that is why it is called Ashtang Yoga. We have the next technique in alternative is meditation. It is the practice of focusing attention on the breath or an object or some thought or mantra. In Vipassana meditation, mindfulness is practiced. That is no fixed object but being in the present. That is mindfulness. The person passively observes the various bodily sensations and thoughts which are passing through awareness without talking to them, conversing to them. So no self-talk, just passively sitting and observing the thoughts and being in the present. Next we have a Sudarshan Kriya Yoga, SKY, very very popular, very very effective, research has quoted a lot of improvement in a lot of problems, psychological disorders, stress, anxiety, PTSD, substance abuse and even rehabilitation of criminal offenders. So here rapid breathing technique is followed and hyperventilation is introduced, that is very very beneficial, low risk and very effective treatment. Next we have is Kundalini Yoga. It is found to be very effective in the treatment of mental disorders like obsessive compulsive disorders. It combines breathing techniques with chanting of mantras. It helps the patient to process emotional stimuli much better. So the understanding of the problem the person is able to gain an insight into and therefore the person is not able to be uh, having any biases in the processing of these stimuli. That is where Kundalini Yoga really helps. The last topic of the chapter that we have is the rehabilitation of mentally ill. 
Rehabilitation is a really important process, a lot of times neglected. It is really important, reason being once therapy has taken place. After that, the person needs to be put back into the environment for starting to work, for adjusting with the family, for adjusting with the new changes that he or she has learnt. So rehabilitation is required to help people become self-sufficient. The aim is to empower them to become a productive member of society to the highest extent possible. It includes the following techniques. First is occupational therapy. The patients are taught skills which can help them take up a job. It could be as simple as candle making, paper bag making, weaving. It just imbibes in them a work discipline. It could also be any other work that the person has skills for. That work will empower the person to get self-confidence, to feel good about himself or herself, become financially independent and will be occupied in something constructive. Second is social skill training, very important again. The person needs to develop interpersonal skills, could be through role play, imitation or any verbalization and instructions. The main idea is to teach the person to function in a social group in a very healthy manner. To be accepted by society, the person needs to develop that confidence to interact with other people, have a social standing. So this is another important aspect. Third is cognitive retraining. It is given to improve the basic cognitive functions of attention, memory and executive functioning. So the own thoughts of a person, the ideas, the assumptions which were faulty, which resulted in a problem are altered to give a way to a healthy cognitive structure that is cognitive retraining. Next is vocational training. The patient is helped to gain skills which are important for undertaking taking some productive employment after the patient has recovered or improved. That will go a long way in settling the person down in a new life and family. That's about it. When we talk about all the concepts discussed today, we talked about and covered humanistic therapy, existential therapy, which included logotherapy. Then we moved on to client-centered therapy given by Carl Rogers. We moved on to gestalt therapy. And then we covered biomedical therapy dealing with medicines and electric shocks. And then we covered the factors which are important for healing a person in psychotherapy. Moving on to alternative ways of doing psychotherapy. And the last was ethics and rehabilitation of the mentally ill. That's about it for this chapter. Thank you. Thank you.